Escape from Evil, the Kate Moir miracle. Imagine being a teenager returning from a night out with friends, only to find yourself in the clutches of Australia's most chilling serial killers. This is not a horror movie plot. This is the real-life terror that 17-year-old Kate Moyer endured. Stay with us as we unravel the harrowing story of bravery, survival, and a fight for justice that shook the nation. Our podcasts delve into complex and sometimes deeply unsettling events. We understand the impact these narratives can have. Should you find yourself in need of assistance or support at any point, we strongly encourage you to reach out to your local crisis centers. Your well-being is paramount and help is available. Welcome to this episode of Whispers of Guilt, where we dive deep into the chilling real-life tale of Kate Moyer's abduction and miraculous escape from the notorious Bernie couple. As we explore the dark corners of this case, we'll uncover the details of her abduction, the psychological warfare she waged to survive, and the legacy she's built in the fight against violent crimes. Join us as we step into the terrifying world that Kate bravely navigated and emerged from, forever changing the course of Australian criminal history. Before we begin, picture yourself at 17, your whole life ahead of you, filled with dreams and possibilities. Now imagine that in one night, everything changes. This is where our story begins with a young model named Kate, a night out and an encounter that turned into Australia's most horrifying nightmare. Background on Kate Moyer and the Burnies. In the sun-drenched suburbs of Perth, Australia, during the 1980s, 17-year-old Kate Moyer epitomized the vibrant spirit of youth. With dreams as luminous as the Australian sun, she navigated a world filled with the typical joys and trials of teenage life, modeling with grace beyond her years and surrounded by a loving family. Her life was a colorful mosaic of school, friendships and aspirations, seemingly untouched by the darker shades of the world. However, David and Catherine Burney were lurking within the same community, a seemingly mundane couple whose ordinary facade masked a sinister reality. They were an unremarkable pair to the casual observer, with David holding an inconspicuous job and Catherine tending to their home. Yet behind the closed doors of their unassuming house, they harbored a terrifying secret. Bound by a shared, twisted compulsion, they descended into infamy, embarking on a terrifying spree that terrorized Perth. Their heinous acts, starkly contrasted with the laid-back Australian lifestyle of the time, a period marked by economic reforms and cultural shifts. David Burney, the oldest of five in a dysfunctional family, was known for his troubling behavior from a young age. With a history marred by criminal activities, his life was a series of disturbing incidents and time spent in and out of prison. His disturbing tendencies only grew over time, culminating in a life of crime that would become infamous across Australia. On the other hand, Catherine Margaret Harrison Burney's life was shaped by early tragedy and instability. After the death of her mother and brother, and a childhood disrupted by custody battles and run-ins with the law, she met David Burney at a young age. Their toxic relationship was punctuated by periods of separation and reunion. Despite a brief attempt at a conventional life, including marriage and motherhood with another man, Catherine's path inevitably led back to David. Together, they forged a partnership marked by darkness and cruelty. The contrasting lives of Kate Moyer and the Burnies represent the stark duality of existence in 1980s Perth. On one hand, there was the bright, hopeful life of a young girl full of potential. On the other, the horrifying descent into the moral abyss by two individuals. This period of cultural blossoming and hidden darkness set the stage for a story of terror, survival and resilience that would leave an indelible mark on Australian history. The Abduction On the fateful evening of November 9, 1986, the air in Perth was charged with the electrifying buzz of youth and freedom. With the innocence of her teenage years still cloaking her, Kate Moyer set out to enjoy a concert with friends, a night of music and laughter, a celebration of life's simple pleasures. As the night unfolded, the city's lights danced in her eyes, each one a beacon of the dreams she carried within her. As the concert ended, the crowd dispersed into the night, each individual a story returning to the routine of their lives. Filled with the night's euphoria, 
Kate decided to hitch a ride home, a decision as commonplace as the setting sun in those days. Thumb out, she waited, her mind replaying the night's melodies, unaware that her life was about to change most horrifyingly. It wasn't long before a car pulled up, its occupants a couple who appeared harmless, even friendly. With the trust characteristic of her youth, Kate accepted their offer of a ride, sliding into the back seat with a grateful smile. As they drove through the streets of Perth, the conversation was light, the atmosphere benign. But as they veered off the familiar path, a subtle shift began to permeate the air. Kate's smile faltered as she reached for the door, only to find there were no handles. Panic whispered her name, a chilling realization dawning without an exit. She glanced at the couple, their once benign demeanor now an unyielding mask of sinister intent. The car's interior, once a haven from the night's chill, now felt like a moving prison, each object a participant in her impending nightmare. The streets outside blurred into a nightmarish tableau, each passing light a missed opportunity for salvation. Kate's mind raced, terror and disbelief vying for control. How could a night that began with such promise twist into such horror? Her thoughts spiralled, grappling with the reality of her situation, each moment stretching into an eternity of fear. As the car continued its ominous journey, Kate's life as she knew it receded into the distance, a fading melody swallowed by the dark symphony of her abduction. The night that had begun with the laughter of friends and the resonance of music was now silent, save for the ominous heartbeat of a terrified young girl and the quiet hum of a car on its way to infamy. First night of captivity. The door to the Bernie's house creaked open, ushering Kate into a world far removed from anything she had ever known. The room she was thrust into was chillingly ordinary, a stark contrast to the terror that clutched her heart. Walls that might once have echoed with mundane domesticity now stood silent, bearing witness to the unspeakable. The air was heavy with a sinister stillness, each breath a reminder of the nightmare that had ensnared her. As the Bernies secured her with chains, the cold metal biting into her skin, the room transformed before her eyes. What might have been a simple suburban bedroom was now a prison, each item a tool of her torment. The chains, a cruel reminder of her lost freedom, rattled with every tremor that coursed through her body. The bed, a place of rest in any other circumstance, was now an altar of horror. The Bernies moved around her with disquieting normalcy, their actions methodical and practiced. They forced her to watch movies, a perverse parody of a family night in. The films played on, their soundtracks a discordant lullaby, as Kate's mind raced with fear and desperation. The couple's conversations with her were a twisted form of engagement, seeking to disorient and dominate her spirit. As the hours stretched on, Kate's emotional and mental state fluctuated wildly between terror, disbelief and a growing resolve. She realized that to survive, she would need to harness every ounce of her strength, wit and will. Her fear, while overwhelming, was also a source of clarity, sharpening her senses and focusing her thoughts on the singular goal of survival. David Burney raped Kate for the first time just after midnight, while Catherine Burney watched and took notes. During the night, she was given a pen and paper to write goodbye letters to her loved ones, then made to shower again, and was moved to the master bedroom where she was raped again. David Burney handcuffed her foot to his and gave her some pills to take, and she was told to go to sleep. As the first night drew to a close, Kate lay in a state of hyper-awareness, the chains a cruel reminder of her reality. The room around her, once ordinary, was now etched into her memory as a tableau of her ordeal. And as she closed her eyes, not in sleep, but in a momentary retreat into her mind, she steeled herself for what was to come, knowing that her fight was only beginning. Survival Strategies In the confines of her horrific new reality, Kate Moyer's mind raced with the urgency of the hunted. Each second was a clash between despair and determination, between succumbing to her fate and forging a path to freedom. As she lay in chains, her spirit refused to be shackled. With a resilience that defied her dire circumstances, she began to weave a delicate tapestry of survival, each thread a calculated move in her high-stakes game against the Burnies. 
Kate became an astute observer, her eyes and ears attuned to the slightest nuances in her captors' behavior. She noted the shifts in their moods, the ebb and flow of their interactions, and the cracks in their facade of control. Mainly, she focused on Catherine, sensing the dynamics of power and influence between the couple. In Catherine's words, glances and gestures, Kate discerned vulnerabilities, subtle fissures in her armor of cruelty. Amid the terror, Kate executed subtle acts of rebellion, each one a quiet assertion of her will to survive. She left traces of her presence, small but significant markers that might one day tell her story or lead to her rescue. These were not just physical acts but also psychological maneuvers, her way of asserting that she was still there, still fighting, even as the Burnies sought to erase her identity. Her interactions with the Burnies were a masterclass in psychological warfare. She listened and responded, her words carefully chosen to elicit sympathy or confusion, to plant seeds of doubt, or to buy precious moments of respite. With Catherine, she sought to build a rapport, however tenuous, using flattery, agreement, or shared confidence to create a semblance of trust. Kate understood that her mind was her most potent weapon in this twisted environment. In the dead of night, as the house lay quiet, Kate's mind was ablaze with strategies. Each scenario played out in her head, each potential escape route mapped with meticulous care. She knew that her chance when it came would be fleeting and fraught with danger. But she also knew that her will to live, to return to the world she had been torn from, was a force to be reckoned with. Kate's survival was not just a physical battle, but a relentless pursuit of hope in the face of overwhelming darkness. With each passing hour, she fortified her resolve, her every thought and action a step towards liberation. Her courage, intelligence, and indomitable spirit were the weapons she wielded against the unspeakable evil of the Burnies, a beacon of defiance on the longest night of her life. The Escape In the dim light of dawn, as the Burnies' household lay in a deceitful calm, Kate Moyer's heart pounded with a fierce, unyielding rhythm. It was a moment of precarious opportunity, a sliver of chance that she knew might not come again. Her captor's vigilance had lapsed just slightly, but enough for her to sense the possibility of escape. The air was thick with tension, every second a countdown to a chance at freedom or a deeper plunge into the nightmare. With bated breath, Kate approached the window, her every movement deliberate and silent. The window, a barrier between her and the outside world, now appeared to her as the gateway to salvation. Her fingers trembled as they worked to force the window open, the task monumental in its difficulty yet driven by an adrenaline fueled determination. The lock finally gave way with a nearly imperceptible click, a sound that, to Kate, was as loud as a clarion call. Without a moment's hesitation, she pushed the window open and faced the precipice. The ground below promised pain, but also hope. With a deep, steadying breath, she made her decision. The jump was a blur of motion, a fleeting sensation of flight, followed by a jarring impact that sent waves of pain through her body. She had hit her head on the concrete and was now semi-conscious, but the pain was a small price to pay for the taste of freedom, however fleeting it might be. Kate rose, her body protesting, her mind singular in its focus. She ran. The neighborhoods of Perth passed in a whirlwind, each street a dizzying maze, each turn a desperate bid to put distance between herself and her captors. The early morning world was a blur of shapes and shadows, the occasional face a fleeting chance at rescue. Her lungs burned, her injuries screamed, but her spirit soared with the hope of survival. Encounters were brief and frantic, doors knocked on, pleas made, the constant fear of being dragged back to hell nipping at her heels. Rejection and confusion met her at every turn, but she pressed on, driven by an overpowering instinct to live, to see the sun rise again in a world where she was free. Finally, salvation came in the form of a stranger, a lone figure standing outside a shop, who listened to her disjointed, frantic story. The man took her to the police station. The reality of her escape began to sink in, and Kate's body and mind succumbed to the overwhelming exhaustion and relief. The nightmare was over, but its echoes would resonate long after she healed. 
Kate's escape was a testament to her indomitable will, a harrowing journey from the depths of despair to the first sweet breaths of freedom. It was a flight not just from physical captivity, but from the shadow of death that had loomed over her. As she was led to safety, her story of extraordinary courage and resilience began to unfold, a narrative that would inspire and horrify in equal measure. Aftermath and Impact In the immediate aftermath of her escape, a battered and traumatized Kate Moyer found herself at a police station, her survival instinct still coursing through her veins. However, her ordeal was far from over. As she sat before the skeptical eyes of the authorities, her words, though earnest and desperate, were met with an incredulity that pierced deeper than the physical wounds she bore. In a society where such monstrous tales were relegated to fiction, her truth seemed too horrifying, too fantastical to be believed. Despite the vividness of her account, the details of her captivity, and the evidence of her terror etched into her very being, there was an initial hesitance to accept her story. Perhaps it was the magnitude of the horror she described, or the disbelief that such evil could reside so close, hidden behind the veneer of suburban normality. The police, bound by protocol and precedent, grappled with the possibility that her tale was a concocted escape from a different, less sinister reality. Kate, however, stood firm. Her resolve, hardened by the nightmare she had endured, became her armor. Each doubt cast her way, each skeptical glance, each probing question only fueled her determination to see justice served. She repeated her story, each iteration a battle against the disbelief that threatened to silence her. With every word, she fought not just for herself, but for the unseen victims who had no voice, for the truth that lurked in the shadows of the Bernie's House of Horrors. It was a grueling process, a test of her endurance and will. But as the cracks in her captor's facade began to show, as the investigation unfolded and the chilling evidence corroborated her account, the tide began to turn. Skepticism gave way to a dawning realization of the gravity and truth of her words. The police, now galvanized by the undeniable reality of her ordeal, shifted from doubt to action. The shift was palpable. The initial disbelief that had greeted her turned into a focused intent to right the wrongs she had suffered. As the Burnies were apprehended and the full extent of their crimes began to surface, the world watched, shaken and stirred by the courage of a young woman who refused to be dismissed, who stood steadfast against the tide of skepticism until her truth was undeniable. In those first critical hours, Kate's struggle laid bare the challenges victims face in being heard and believed. It was a poignant reminder of the need for empathy, diligence and an unwavering commitment to seeking the truth no matter how uncomfortable or inconceivable it may be. Arrest and Trial As the truth of Kate Moyer's harrowing story began to take hold, the wheels of justice started turning with a newfound urgency. The police, now driven by the grim reality of Kate's ordeal, swiftly moved to apprehend David and Catherine Burney. The arrest was a moment of vindication for Kate, a tangible sign that her bravery and persistence had ignited the pursuit of justice. The Burnies were taken into custody, their facade of normalcy stripped away to reveal the malevolence that lurked beneath. As investigators descended upon the house that had served as the stage for their unspeakable acts, the true extent of their depravity began to unfurl. The evidence uncovered was damning. Personal belongings of the victims, chilling recordings of the assaults and chains with locks shackled to the bed, a testament to their sinister exploits and the horrors that had transpired within those walls. The trial that ensued was a spectacle that gripped the nation. The public, horrified yet morbidly fascinated, followed every development. In the courtroom, the gruesome details of the Bernie's crimes were laid bare, each testimony and piece of evidence painting a portrait of evil that was almost beyond comprehension. Kate took the stand her voice unwavering as she recounted the nightmares she had lived through. As the trial unfolded, it became increasingly clear that the Burney's reign of terror had extended far beyond what was initially imagined. Other cases, once cold and forgotten, were re-examined in a new light, revealing a sinister pattern of abductions and murders. The couple had preyed upon the vulnerable, 
there acts a dark and continuous blight that had, until then, gone undetected. The conviction of the Burnies brought a sense of closure, but it was a closure tinged with sorrow and anger. The life sentences handed down to them were a small comfort to the families who had lost loved ones and to a community shaken to its core. The trial was not just a reckoning of the crimes committed, it was a mirror held up to society, reflecting the darkness that can hide in plain sight and the importance of vigilance and compassion. For Kate, the trial was another step in her journey, a public affirmation of her fight for justice. It was an emotionally taxing experience, reliving the trauma in the pursuit of justice. Still, she bore a burden with strength and dignity that inspired all who bore witness. Her testimony ensured that the Burnies would never again harm another soul. The victims of the Burnies, Mary Nielsen. A 22-year-old psychology student, Mary Nielsen, fell victim to the Burnies after being lured with the promise of cheap tires. Brutally assaulted and raped at their Morehouse Street residence, she was later transported to Glen Eagle, where her life ended through strangulation and stabbing. Nielsen, who was close to completing her degree, was buried in a shallow grave by the couple. Susanna Candy. At just 15, Susanna Candy was abducted while hitchhiking. The Burnies forced her to send reassuring letters to her family, before subjecting her to the same horrific fate as Nielsen. After a failed strangulation attempt, Catherine, under David's command, killed Candy with a nylon cord. She was buried alongside Nielsen in Glen Eagle, Noeline Patterson. Noeline Patterson, a 31-year-old bar manager, ran out of gas and was picked up by the Burnies. Held captive for three days due to David's unusual attachment to her, she was ultimately killed by an overdose of sleeping tablets followed by strangulation. Patterson's demise was marked by Catherine's jealousy and was buried separately at Glen Eagle. Denise Brown. Denise Brown, a 21-year-old, was abducted from a bus stop and endured the same atrocities as previous victims. After being assaulted, she was taken to the Wanneroo Pine Plantation where her life ended in a shallow grave after a failed escape attempt. Kate Moyer. Kate Moyer, 17, was taken at knife point on November 9th after accepting a lift from the Burnies. David compelled her to call her mother while holding a knife to her throat. Moyer told her mother she'd had too much to drink and was staying at a friend's house, hoping her mother would realize it was a lie and call the friend, knowing she wasn't a drinker. Moya later alleged that when she questioned if they wanted to kill or rape her, she was told, we'll only rape you if you're good. She was forced to dance for the Burnies and slept in their bed with David chained. Catherine walked to the front door to carry out a heroin trade after David left for work the day after her capture and failed to chain Moya to the bed. After breaking the latch, Moya climbed through an adjacent window, but she banged her head on the concrete. After knocking on numerous neighbors' homes, Moya told police about her ordeal. The Burnies had given themselves aliases, but Moya had read David's name on a medicine bottle. Moya stated the couple had watched the film Rocky on video and described a drawing she had concealed in the house as proof of her presence. The sketch and the Rocky movie tape copy were later discovered by the police inside the Burnies' VCR. After being detained, the Burnies provided contradictory testimony in their interrogations. Catherine claimed she had never seen Moi, but David maintained Moi had visited their home willingly to have consensual sex. David was coerced into confessing and revealing the location of the prior victim's graves by Detective Sergeant Vince Katich. Other possible victims, the Burnies are also suspected in the disappearances of Cheryl Renwick, Barbara Weston, and possibly Lisa Marie Mott. These cases remain shrouded in mystery, adding to the dark legacy of the Bernie's crimes. Kate Moyer's story is not just one of survival. It's a testament to the human spirit's resilience and the profound impact one brave voice can have. Her courage not only led to the capture of two serial killers, but also brought about significant changes in the justice system, ensuring that the voices of victims are heard and their tormentors face the consequences of their actions. If Kate's story has moved you, we encourage you to learn more and support victims' advocacy groups in your area. 
Share this episode to continue discussing the importance of justice and reform in the legal system. And if you or someone you know is in a threatening situation, remember Kate's story of bravery and seek help immediately.